Rob Venier. Today we're going to be looking at the industrial context of the life on Mars and Bridge. Uh, we're also going to be looking at audiences and things like that. So, what kind of things do we look, need to look at for media industries? We're going to need to look at the process of production, distribution, and circulation by organizations, groups, and individuals in a global context. The specialized and institutionalized nature of media production, distribution, and circulation. That's for both episodes. The relationship of recent technological change in media production, distribution, and circulation. You can get that in sections B and C. The significance of the patterns of ownership and control, including conglomerate ownership, vertical integration, and diversification. The significance of economic factors, including commercial and not-for-profit public funding to maintain industries and their products. And how media organisations maintain, including through marketing, a variety of audiences nationally and globally. All that applies to all, uh, both television programmes. I will be doing separate videos on marketing, promotion, merchandising, etc. We'll be looking at the regulatory framework of contemporary media in the UK. Uh, the impact of new digital technologies on media regulation, including the role of individual producers. That's only for section C. How processes of production, distribution, circulation shape media products for both shows. The impact of digital conversion platforms on media production, distribution, and circulation. Again, that's both B and C. The role of regulation on global production, distribution, circulation for both EP shows. And the effect of individual producers on media products, but that only applies to life on Mars. Right, okay, theories we need to talk about. Power and Media Industries by Karen and Seaton. Regulation by Livingston and Lance and Cultural Industries by Hesma Gulch. You need to be mentioning all of those theories in any essay you do, pretty much, depending on what the question asks, mind you. But you need to know these theories by heart. We haven't really talked about them much since the beginning of last year, so you need to go back and familiarise yourself with them. Right, let's start looking at the technology first. This will apply to the process of production. Um, we will look at the specialised institutional needs of production and how recent technological changes have affected production. Now, Life on Mars was shot on 16mm film. Now, this is unusual in today's day and age when more and more products have been shot on high-definition digital video because they're distributed digitally, they're watched digitally. It makes sense to produce them digitally, it's cheaper. But Life on Mars was shot on 16mm film. This is for aesthetic reasons principally, not economic ones. Obviously because the Life on Mars is a pastiche, even to the point of parody of the Sweeney, it's a postmodern simulacra, if you will, it wants to look like a 70s TV show. It wants to look like the Sweeney. The Sweeney was shot on 16mm. This was very unusual for a TV show in the 1970s to be shot entirely on 16mm because it was expensive. But it gave the show a much more cinematic look. It gave it high production values and it made it one of the, you know, the most prestige television programs of its day. Um, it was also a convention of television in those days that interior scenes were shot on video, but exteriors were shot on film, which gave the exteriors and the interiors a very different aesthetic. You can easily see this with much old television programs like, say, Faulty Towers. The interiors and the exteriors look completely different for that reason. As you can see down here, we've got a 16mm film camera with its film canister here. This is the bridge, however, which as you can see is being shot on high definition digital video camera. Um, I don't know what format it is. I've tried and failed to find out. I'm assuming it's 1080p 2K, which is standard television format. I mean, it could have been shot in a higher format like 4K and then uh, downsized, but don't expect so. Now, Let's have a look at the globalised nature of television. We've got to remember that there's a significance of the patterns of ownership and control. The companies that made these TV programmes are essentially conglomerate. 
the BBC is horizontally and vertically integrated. It has the ability to produce and distribute its own formats and television programs. It will usually do so with the help of some commercial TV production company. But obviously it will then be broadcast on its own television channels. They own their own DVD and Blu-ray manufacturing and distribution company, their own wing. They've obviously got BBC iPlayer. Um, and now that new BritBox streaming service is coming out. So that makes them totally vertically integrated. We've also got to consider the economic factors. Um, both of these TV shows were made by public service broadcasters. Now you need to go back and look at the public service broadcasting stuff we did when we looked at Late Night Woman's Hour because the BBC is both radio and television, so the same thing fits both. Okay. These are not-for-profit organisations. However, they will sell their products abroad in order to make money. You've got to remember that high-quality, high-prestige TV dramas like this are exceptionally expensive to make, often costing over a million pounds an hour. Um, I don't know what these programmes cost, but I know for a fact that The Walking Dead costs $7 million an episode on average. So we're talking extremely expensive programming and public service broadcasters, even with their license fee like the BBC, don't necessarily have the kind of money to be able to totally independently fund these kind of programs. So they need European money. They need co-production money. Now, these programmes are intended to be sold not just to a domestic market, so shown on British TV, but to be sold abroad as well. So programmes like Top Gear, programmes like Doctor Who have got massive worldwide fan bases and huge viewing figures. Not only the actual programmes sold abroad, but the formats are as well. So you know, practically every country in the world makes its own version of Top Gear. And uh, Top of the Pops, which isn't really made in this country anymore, but it's still very popular abroad. Also, you'll get other countries trying to do remakes of our TV programmes. Big Brother being a classic example. Being sold all over the world. Um, you know, Strictly Come Dancing. as it was, And, you know, this has been sold abroad. Dancing with the Stars, for example, in America. Stuff like that. But you've also got to remember that BBC iPlayer has now got an international version, so you can watch these programmes abroad. And the fact that these things are also shown on Netflix and Amazon Prime, and say in America, things like BBC America, give it a much more international audience. So people will never have seen these programmes normally and now being able to watch them. Just think about the massive impact that something like Fleabag has had. It's become a massive worldwide hit. You just had Barack Obama listing it as one of his three top TV programs of 2019. People, you know, Americans would not have been seeing Fleabag, which was made for a tiny British online-only channel, BBC Three, if it wasn't for Netflix. It's also the case that a couple of programs have been sold to Amazon Prime by the BBC, um, most notably um, Ripper Street, for example. And, of course, the defection of the entire Top Gear team over to Amazon to make um, the Grand Tour, for example. Now, the showing of non-English language television on British TV has been a fairly recent phenomenon. There were some shows like High Mat, which was a German program that was shown on Channel 4 back in the 80s, but that was quite rare. And we have to consider how media organisations maintain through marketing varieties of audiences nationally and globally. Now, foreign language television has become quite a big deal in the UK lately. It was BBC4 who kicked this off back in 2006 when they started broadcasting one of my favourite shows, Engrenage, or Spiral as it's known in English, which is a French policier, a French cop show. 
Um, I've been banging on about how great this show is for years, but no one seems to listen to me. Um, that was a pretty big hit on BBC Four on a Saturday evening with the tennis show double episodes back to back. This led on to other shows like Wallander, um, The Killing, which became something of a cultural phenomenon. Um, then The Bridge, um, Arna Dahl, and all these other TV programs, um, The Return, things like that. They've become a little niche on a Saturday night on BBC4, and they're very popular with a certain middle-brow, middle-class audience who are willing to sit down and read subtitles. Um, so The Killing started being broadcast in 2011. Um, highly recommend both of these shows. They are outstanding really high quality in particular the killing like the bridge the example of a genre called nordic noir which includes you know films and things like the girl with the dragon tattoo they've become incredibly successful and trendy lately this is spread to other channels channel 4 has got its walter presents wing which um, is mainly available online but they do show plenty of um, foreign language shows Babylon Berlin was a good one um, Deutschland 88 I think it was called or something like that anyway there's a couple of them that was really really good uh, Sky Atlantic's got into it with things like Gamora spin-off of an Italian uh, mafia show spin-off of a movie and then you've got Danish television being very popular lately so you've got The Legacy which is on Sky Arts all again middle brow TV. Now this stuff is all mainstream in its home country, but in this country, of course, it's going to get a niche audience because they're not in English. Still, all surprisingly very popular with pretty large viewing figures considering that they're in foreign languages. Now we've also got to consider where the money for this stuff comes from. As I said, it's very expensive to make these shows. So we've got to look at the process of production, distribution and circulation by organisations, groups and individuals in a global context. The specialised and institutionalised nature of media production, distribution and circulation. The relationship of recent technological changes on media production, distribution and circulation. The significance of patterns of ownership and control, including conglomerate ownership, vertical and integration and diversification. And the significance of economic factors, including commercial and not-for-profit funding to media industries and products. Now... A lot of the money for these shows come from European funding. You can get tax breaks off the European Union for making these programs. Equally, you can get tax breaks from the BFI for making high quality drama in the UK as well, um, providing us over a certain budget. Um, if it classifies as a UK domestic production under schedule one of the uk films act um you can get i think it's depending on how much it costs but anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of your tax back which is a large chunk of cash um so a lot of high quality highbrow tv programs being made qualify for that money now the european union provides production and distribution grants through its media sub-program of the Creative Europe initiative. Now, in the case of The Bridge, the production company Filmlands International received a grant of 1 million euros for the third season of the show back in 2014. It's not the first time they got money off media. They had been awarded 400,000 euros for the first season back in 2010. Now, that's quite a lot of money when you consider that the budget for the series was about £10 million pounds. That's a um, hundred million krona. To qualify for these grants um, and this funding, there's certain requirements you've got to fulfill. So you've got to film in a particular region or location. Um, this is usually done in such a way as to attract um, employment into an area. Similarly, in this country, we have things like the uh, the different kind of like uh, media agencies so we've got screen yorkshire and east midlands media and these kind of stuff that will provide grants if you go and film in their area to bring jobs into the area um, you've got to employ crew members from a particular nation you've got to work collaboratively collaboratively 
with other international companies. You've got to demonstrate potential for wider international distribution. See, this is important for getting profit. You've got to make sure that your program is going to be saleable all across Europe or preferably the entire world. And your media program is designed to support European productions in particular. So, I mean, you can have co-productions with America. So, for example, the BBC tended to pioneer this back in the early noughties with programs like um, Rome and uh, Band of Brothers, which were BBC and HBO co-productions. So you get quite a lot of programs nowadays as sort of like American-British co-productions. Again, this media program designed to support European television programs with the potential to circulate within the European Union and beyond. Um, how this is going to affect British TV productions post-Brexit is another matter altogether. This could have serious repercussions on the British media industry. Brexit could be disastrous for our film industry. Uh, we shall see. The other thing about this is it's not just the case of selling the actual show, the episodes abroad. It's also about selling the format. So there's been lots of remakes of these programs. As I said, we've got to consider the the economic factors. We've got to consider the patterns of ownership, the diversification, the fact that you can sell it abroad, national global stuff. So TV companies will sell the rights to remake a show. As I've already mentioned, the bridge has been adapted for various different international markets. In the UK, there was a UK French co production called The Tunnel, which was produced by Kudos Productions for Sky Atlantic and Canal Plus. Um, that was really good, actually, well worth watching. Um, it replaced the bridge from the bridge with the Channel Tunnel. Good show. There was an American version made for FX that was set on the US Mexican border. And there's a Russian version set on the Russian Estonian border for the NTV network. Uh, the Life on Mars US remake from 2008 2009 was a total failure. Um, it's available to stream. I think it's on Netflix. Um, yeah, they made a mess of that. There was a Russian remake called The Dark Side of the Moon because Pink Floyd is apparently more popular in Russia than David Bowie which is unsurprising considering their attitude towards homosexuality. Um, that was the most popular TV show in its time shot slot in Russia. So the format's obviously, you know, transferable quite easily. There was also a Spanish version called La Chica de Ella, The Girl from Yesterday. That would have been particularly interesting because, of course, in the 1970s, Spain would have been fascist because it would have been under the Franco regime. It would be interesting to see that. Well, of course, you know, the... Russian version would have been, I don't know what it was, probably on a Khrushchev, something like that. But still, under communism, that would have been interesting. Puts a different political spin on it, you don't really get in the British one. Now, let's consider the Life on Mars as a programme. Let's get some facts and figures we need to fill in. Okay, so, this covers the patterns of ownership, it's the process of distribution production, um, and it covers the economic factors. So Life on Mars, there are two series of only 16 episodes. Um, this is interesting because British television programs are notoriously a lot shorter than American ones. Um, American television programs tend to have at least 18 episodes per season, as they say in America, because you need at least 18 episodes to get picked up in syndication. What that meant is one of the four mainstream TV channels made most of the programs. But once they'd shown them, they would sell them off to regional TV broadcasters. They would syndicate it um, so they would get repeated. Um, so their series tend to be a lot longer, whereas British ones tend to be much, much shorter. Um, it was produced by an independent production company called Kudos Film and TV. Uh, who also made Spooks and Hustle, which are two of the other really big, you know, A-grade TV shows the BBC has got on its roster. Interestingly, it was produced by BBC Wales, which is quite strange for a programme set in Manchester. Um, 
But again, we, you know, so with Doctor Who we'll come to that. Maybe for BBC Wales, that is not set in Manchester. It had a spin-off series called Ashes to Ashes, which was set in the 80s and had a female protagonist. Um, but many of the same cast and crew of the original one. Also very good, worth watching. As I said, there was an American adaptation, which had a pilot in one season. Um, starred Harvey Keitel, so it had a big star in it, but it was a disaster. Like I said, there were Spanish and Russian versions as well. It was also uh, produced as part of the BBC's regional initiative. Um, essentially, they've got a thing where they're trying to make more TV programming outside of London. Um, so setting it in Manchester was part of that regional initiative. Um, obviously, quite a lot of the BBC's and in Channel 4's production is based in Salford, just outside Manchester. It was internationally successful. It was shown in many English-speaking territories, so Australia, the USA, New Zealand, Canada, but it also was shown in France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Israel, Ireland, Sweden, Finland, the Netherlands, and Hong Kong. So it had quite an international base, as well as having international remakes. What's interesting is it was originally developed for Channel 4, but they didn't like it, so they dropped it. It was originally called Ford Granada, which is a spin on the name of the car that's in it. Um, but it was rejected once by the BBC as well. Um, finally, as I said, BBC Wales picked it up and it became a massive hit. Now, when it was on, it attracted 31.57% of the audience share in its time slot 70 percent of all uk tv viewing by the way is terrestrial tv um, as we can see here this is the kind of breakdown of the viewing of the different channels so as you can see all 31.57 percent of all tv viewing is the bbc 21.71 percent is itv 10.23% is Channel 4. 826 is everything on Sky. Everything on Sky is less than what the amount of people watch Channel 4. Channel 5 is 6.53%. So, as you can see, the BBC still dominates broadcast viewing. This is from 2018, these figures. Bearing in mind at that point, the population in the UK was 66.57 million people. So... When we think of technology, we tend to think of Netflix and Amazon Prime as taking over. Now, I'm sure that as digital natives, you probably don't really watch television. You probably spend most of your time watching things on the internet, whether it be Amazon Prime, whether it be Netflix, whether it be YouTube or some other service like Disney Plus or whatever, or whether you're just pirating it. You're probably not watching linear, as they call it, live broadcast TV. I'm the same. I very rarely watch linear live broadcast TV unless it's sport. But we're in the minority. We tend to think these technologies are taking over. In reality, most people still watch the BBC and they watch it live. Um, when it comes to, and again, these are 2018 figures... Subscription video on demand, SVOD, okay? 26 million, well, 26.5 million people in this country have access in 2018 to video on demand, all right? That's nearly 21 million have got Netflix, nearly 11 million have got Amazon, and 3.5 million have got Now TV. So quite a lot of penetration into the TV market but I mean this was a few years ago so if this is 2018 figures they'd have probably come out in 2017 so you know now it's 2020 you're going to get an increase in imagine in all of those but not massively right now we've got to consider patterns of ownership and the institutional nature of media production You've got to remember that the BBC is a public service broadcaster, a PSB. 
The BBC One has a public service remit. It has its Rethian ideal to inform, educate and entertain. But it also has a remit to be the, B, the, 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 where the BBC has got to be the most popular mixed genre television service in the UK. And it's got to offer a wide range of high quality programmes. It's got to target all audiences and it's got to be high quality. You know, it's part of the reason for existence to be the most popular of all broadcasting in the country. So it should be the BBC's primary outlet for major UK and international events, and it should reflect the whole of the UK in its output. A very high proportion of its programme should be original productions, says the BBC Charter. Now this fits Life on Mars. It is an original production. They don't buy in a lot of foreign television programmes, the BBC, unlike other channels. They tend to make most of their own programming. And they tend to make most of the high quality drama in this country. Now, BBC One programmes should exhibit some or all of the following characteristics. They've got to be high quality, original, challenging, innovative and engaging, and it should nurture UK talent. To be fair, we can say all of that about life on Mars. BBC One should deliver its remake through high quality programming, with wide appeal across all genres. Well, this is a hybrid genre. It's sci-fi. It's a cop show. It's a drama. These should be commissioned from a wide pool of suppliers, independent, so it's public-private initiatives and uh, cooperation. Demonstrate high production values, definitely the case with Life on Mars, and feature the best talent on and off the screen. Again, definitely true of Life on Mars. BBC One should regularly broadcast programmes of large scale and ambition, definitely with Life on Mars, and should encourage innovation delivered in a way that appeals to a broad audience taking creative risks and regularly experiment with new talent and ideas. Definitely true of Life on Mars. BBC One should be the BBC's main platform for television drama, especially in peak time. Drama should be one of the biggest creators of BBC One's impact with the audience. Definitely true of Life on Mars. Content that comes from and reflects the nations, regions and communities of the UK should feature on BBC One. Well, this is the North Manchester, not just London. Now, you've got to remember that as a genre, crime shows are one of the most popular genres for television. Okay? Just look at the TV schedules and look at how many of them are crime dramas. Now, I can't find details for the UK, but they're massively important for any TV channel and their ratings. In the US, 42% of people regularly watch crime drama according to Parrot Analytics crop platform Hottest Genres from January, February 2016. They've had a high demand rating across 44 countries. Kayla Hedges, um, mitblog.com, found that 29.5% of people watch crime dramas regularly. So that's, a, you know, knocking on a third of people to just under a half of people. So we're talking a majorly important genre. Life on Mars was shown in peak time. Okay. Just after the watershed. Eight one hour episodes on Monday nights. Now, this is interesting because back in those days, this was pre iPlayer. In fact, it was pre any streaming service because the BBC iPlayer was the first streaming service in this country. There was, in those days, back in 2006, no Netflix, no Amazon Prime, and I don't think there was even YouTube then. So people used to actually watch one episode a week. Imagine, gosh, right? Don't get that anymore, do you? Nowadays, more and more people are binge watching things. Anyway, it was peak time. Everyone had sat down. They'd had their tea. Kids were in bed. EastEnders had finished. So you had EastEnders at 8 o'clock. Then you got Outtake TV at 20.30. And you got the BBC News at 10 o'clock. Now, back in those days, maybe even still today, there was a tendency amongst people to stick to one channel. So people who would sit down and watch EastEnders at 8 o'clock would just not bother turning over. They would just watch everything that was on BBC that night. I certainly remember when I was a kid, there were 
BBC households and there are ITV households. You know, I wasn't allowed to watch ITV in my household because ITV was seen as being a bit common. And the BBC was more middle brow, was more aspirational, it was more, you know, posh, if you will. Even though I lived in a very working class household, my parents didn't want us to be working class. Okay, so there's also a thing called hammocking or tent poling. Hammocking is where you put a new or less successful television program in between two successful established ones in the hope that it would inherit their viewers. The opposite end is tent polling, where you put new or less pro popular television programs either side of one that's very popular, again, in the hope you'll inherit the viewing figures of the popular one. So this was the kind of program that was prestige TV. It would have been heavily advertised. People sit down and watch it. Um, it's common to what they call zone crime programs in this time slot because obviously nine o'clock is the watershed that's the time when you know kids aren't supposed to be watching tv so you can put sex you can put nudity you can put violence you can put bad language all of these things work well for crime dramas there's also a thing called stripping stripping is where you will show um each successive episode of a program every night at the same time over a period of nights. So like episode one might be on a Monday, episode two is on Tuesday, episode three is on Wednesday, etc. Um, that wasn't done when it was originally broadcast, but you'll probably find this kind of thing is done when they uh, repeated it. It was also you had catch up, as they call it, repeated episodes on um, Sunday evenings at 10 p.m., and the average viewing figures it was getting was about 6.8 million people, which is pretty good. Um, it was what was called counter-programmed. Um, there's a show on ITV, a comedy drama series called um, Northern Lights, which I've never heard of and has probably disappeared into obscurity. Um, so it was, you know, if you didn't want comedy drama, you could have a crime show on the BBC. So... That's what counter program is. You put something different on your channel compared to somebody else's to capture their audience. So, like, I don't know, if you add, you know, a program on your channel that was, you know, predominantly aimed at a female audience, your competitor channel might do something with it at the same time slot aimed at a male audience. Anyway, the first series gained an average of 7.1 million viewers and a 28% audience share. Pretty good for a show of its type. And it later on became a classic. I mean, it's it's a very well-known, very well, very popular, very well-respected TV show that, you know, people still talk about. Similar situation with The Bridge. Braun or Broen, depending on what language you were in. I think Braun, Swedish. Broen's Danish. Bridge is obviously English. That was... An international co-production between Sweden and Denmark, who are, of course, neighbours. Right? The bridge is the bridge that links the two countries. Now, we are uh, concentrating on the first episode of season three. It had already been a massive success. It was a massive success in Sweden. It was a massive su success in Denmark. And it was a massive success in the UK. Um, in the UK, it was shown on Saturday nights. Started on the 21st and of this episode was shown on 21st of November 2015 at 9 pm in that Nordic Noir slot that the BBC4 tend to have. And it got 1.81 million viewers, which is relatively small when you compare it to the kind of you know, audiences that Life on Mars were getting, but it's pretty damn good for something that's mainly in a mixture of Swedish and Danish. It was written by a guy called Hans Rosenfeld. It was originally broadcast on SVT1 in Sweden and DR1 in Denmark, both of which are public service broadcasters, like the BBC in this country. There were four seasons of 10 episodes per season, 40 episodes in total. It's now finished. Um, outstanding TV show, highly recommend it. Now, who are these people? 
let's look at how media organizations maintain through marketing varieties of audience nationally and globally. Now, SVT, or I can't pronounce this, but Sveriges Television, is the Swedish national public broadcaster. Like the BBC, it's funded by a license fee. Everyone who has a TV set um, has to pay it. Um, I have no idea what the Rick's Dog is. I think that actually is the Swedish government. Uh, Sweden's television is a public limited company that can be described as a quango, a quasi-autonomous non-government organisation. Um, it has regional offices and a production facility in Malmo, and that was used as the police headquarters in the show. Um, politically, it's perceived as being leftist and liberal. Um, the BBC is often also accused of being leftist and liberal by right-wing people, but it's also accused of being right-wing by leftist liberal people. The other co-production company was Denmark's Radio, Denmark's National Public Denmark's National Public Service Broadcasting Corporation. It is also funded by a license fee, payable in Denmark by all owners of radio, television sets, and in recent years, computers and other devices capable of receiving its content. That's also true of the BBC in this country. Our license fee pays not just for television but also for radio and for all the digital content as well. Like uh, SVT1, it's also perceived as being leftist and liberal. There's a good quote to explain this from Lauren Collins in The New Yorker. It dominates Danish cultural life to the extent that each week 97% of the population listens to or watches something from its website or one of its 10 radio stations and six television channels. Danes with televisions pay an annual license fee of about $400, giving DR a yearly budget of $660 million. Because Denmark is small and relatively heterogeneous, DR can attempt to appeal to almost everyone. It is both mass-orientated and high-minded, like CBS and NPR with a touch of HBO. Like the BBC, it's considered a tent pole of the nation's identity, and even it is by definition apolitical, it is suspected in certain quarters of harbouring a left-wing agenda. Very similar to the BBC in that respect then, isn't it? Danish television funding, similar to the BBC's public service remit. Drama and quality programming are often financed through co-funding with external partners, most often foreign broadcasters and foreign distributors. That's also true of the BBC. Um... Canned programming sales and pre-sales of canned programming. So what they will do is they will sell programs as packages. They will often pre-sell them to foreign countries before they're even made. That's what canned means. Um, they also tend to remake foreign programs or sell the, their formats to be remade. Um, they tend to look for international funds, both regional and international, as well as pan-national funds. Again, that's true of the BBC as well. According to the Journal of Popular Television, Volume 4, Number 1, when public service drama travels, the internationalisation of Danish television drama and the associated production funding models. Now, economic context again. Partly paid for by the Copenhagen Film Fund. Um, they actively invest in the series with the aim of bringing much of the series production to Denmark in order to secure more empl employment for Danish film talent. Um, a larger Danish crew had already been signed on for the shoot, ensuring that Danish film industry benefits not only economically but also from the high visibility to international audiences. Uh, co production between Film Lands in Sweden and Nimbus Films in Denmark, they're the production companies. As main producers of the series, co-producing with CFF and Film Iskana, as well as other European partners. People are employed by Filmlands and by Swedish laws and regulations, but the filming and shooting in both countries. Most of it's going to be shot in Malmo in the south of Sweden. Um, Sara Norensen, who's the Saga Norensen, is the main character, is from the Malmo Swedish Police Department. 
Now, this does have its downsides, these international co-productions. Um, in a global marketplace, are already dominated by English language content. Could the potential transition to an era of more international co-productions further homogenize the global market? In other words, will we have less distinctive local content as things are more and more made to appeal to a wide international audience? Is that going to make them more bland, a bit more boring, a bit more homogenous? On the other hand, will the fact that American and British production entities are bringing their money to other regions with fewer resources mean more diversities in the stories being told to a wider global audience? I mean, the cliche is, you know, if you're making a TV program that has American money in it, they're going to want American stars in it, perhaps. You know, or American characters. Or they're going to make you make it in English instead of your language. Um, some television programs get around this. Um, so, for example, um, there's a Welsh program called Hinterland. Uh, which was made by the same production company as The Bridge. And it was an attempt to do a, a Welsh version of a Nordic noir programme. And that was simultaneously shot both in Welsh and English. Um, so it was broadcast on BBC One, I think it was, in English. And BBC Four and S4C in Welsh. So you could pick whichever language you wanted. Um, there's also this question of clash between public and commercial. Um, in most countries, television has developed along much more public lines than in America, where commercial broadcasting pretty much reigns supreme from the get-go. Obviously, um, if you're making things for commercial reasons, you're making it purely to make profit. And that has a tendency to dumb things down traditionally, um, whereas, you know, public broadcasters public service broadcasters tend to have a a remit to target underserved audiences niche audiences and that kind of thing however i think that's becoming less and less untrue in a world of organizations like hbo and fx and stars and these american cable channels which are making a wide variety of extremely high quality television and of course now we've got netflix and amazon prime getting involved in this mix we are very much living in the golden age of TV right now with some exceptionally high quality products that are basically putting a lot of film to shame. As we said, in the UK, BBC One is the country's most watched network. It has a public mandate to inform, educate and entertain. Uh, the BBC holds some kind of responsibility to the state and its citizens. Um, CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, is America's most watched network. It only has a mandate with shareholders. In other words, its only responsibility is to make profit for its shareholders, not to serve the citizens like the BBC does. So does teaming up of public broadcasters with international commercial producers endanger or corrupt responsibility of the public broadcasters to the financial calls of the commercial broadcaster? What's more important, making quality, high, you know, high-class programming that, you know, services the public, or making stuff that's popular? And profitable. Sometimes those two things can go hand in hand. Take a problem like the crown, for example. Now, the bridge in this country is broadcast on BBC Four. BBC Four is a very niche, middle-brow channel. It shows foreign language content. It shows a lot of documentary. It shows a lot of high art and high culture stuff. You know, ballets and operas, things like that, the proms. It has a budget of £48.7 million back in 2016 and 2017. A drop in the ocean compared to the rest of the BBC. Its primary role is to reflect a range of UK and international arts, music and culture. Its closest commercial equivalent in this country would be Sky Arts. It should provide an ambitious range of innovative, high-quality programming that's intellectually and culturally enriching, taking an expert and in-depth approach to a wide range of subjects. It should offer international foreign language feature films and a range of foreign language dramas and documentaries. 
Foreign language output should regularly be subtitled, included in peak time, to allow people from around the world to be heard in their own voices. So this is where these programs come in, especially these Nordic Noir ones. And to be fair, they've been some of the best television programs broadcast in this country. There are some seriously high quality programs being shown in this slot on BBC4. And I recommend you seek them out. They're worth the effort. So, The Bridge. When was it scheduled? Well, it was first broadcast on Wednesday nights at 8pm in Denmark and 9pm in Sweden. Now, that's interesting because it's a pretty dark and disturbing TV show. It looks like Sweden has the same kind of 9 o'clock watershed that we've got, whereas you can get away with showing at 8pm in Denmark. Maybe they're a bit more liberal about these kind of things. Um, by screening the final episode immediately after episode 9 DL1 managed to screen episode 10 simultaneously with SVT1 so they managed to stay the same it's presumably possible in, if you live in Denmark and Sweden to be able to pick up each other's television if you've got the right aerials I'd imagine in the UK it filled the Saturday night 9pm subtitle drama slot that had previously been occupied by Le Revenants, that's the returned hostages, other things like that. That's um, an Israeli TV show, it's pretty good. Uh, the series was shown in weekly two episode blocks of BBC4 and BBC HD from the 21st of April 2012. The Daily Telegraph reported in February 2014 the bridge was on screen in 174 countries. That's pretty impressive. Again, got remade in the US for FX as The Bridge with Diane Kruger, good actress. And this is the Anglo-French one, The Tunnel, made for Canal Plus and Sky Atlantic. Um, some other interesting facts and figures. So, season three of The Bridge launched simultaneously on the 27th of September in Sweden, Denmark and Finland, and the next day in Norway. So it was obviously popular across the entire Scandinavian area. Sweden's SVT1 attracted 1.4 million viewers for the first episode. That's up 459,000 from season 1 and 268,000 from season 2 with season by season overnight ratings growing steadily from 11.4 to 13.1 to 15.8. For Denmark's DR1, 839,000 people tuned in, up 21,000 from season 2 but down 37,000 from season 1. Finland's YLE1 drew 425,000 people, up 60,000 from Season 2. Norway's NRK1 had 577,000 viewers, down 54,000 from Season 2, but up 14,000 from Season 1, making it the only channel that saw a declining viewing ship for the opening episode of Bridge 3. Um, these are very impressive figures when you consider how small the population of these countries are. They've got tiny populations you know, in relation to Britain. Um, this shows you the demographic audience for BBC4. Um, again, these figures are a little bit out of date, but they're concurrent with the times the show was on. So, as you can see, we've got percentages here, I guess. Um, 14, no, I can't be right. Anyway, as you can see, the audience is slightly more male than female. Uh, very few children are going to be watching BBC4. There's nothing on BBC4 for children. Um, but notice the age group as well. Overwhelmingly adults, 55 plus. Overwhelmingly. The rest of them, 35 to 54. So this is a program for middle-aged people. Younger people not really watching it. Again, social class, surprisingly not that bad. Um, obviously, ABC ones dominate, but not that much more than C2 D&Es, which is a bit of a surprise. But also, massively, overwhelmingly white. 15.1 versus 5.6 for BME. BAME. Um, that means... People who aren't white. So we're talking slightly male, mostly 35 to 55 plus, 
slightly more ABC1, mostly white. That's the viewing figures of BBC4. Um, again, age profile, look at that. I mean, 40%, 65% plus. Uh, 55 to 64 is 23%. And 44 to 54 for 17%. So, you know, vast majority of that. I mean, that's what... 10, 20, 30, 40, there's 80% of people watching it are over the age of 44. You know, massive, isn't it? Um, again, this shows you the, all the demographic breakdown of the different BBC channels. So, I'm going to go, this is from 2013 to 2014, but BBC One is pretty much 50-50 between ABC One, C2, D and E. BBC Two is fifty four forty six, so slightly more. ABC One, BBC Three, which is now online only, fifty seven percent C Two D E, forty three percent ABC One, so it's catering more towards the working classes. Again, this is a channel aimed at young people. Um, and again, BBC Four fifty eight percent ABC One versus forty two percent. Um, C2, D and E, so slightly more um, middle class, although not as middle class as I'd have personally thought. I thought it would be a higher percentage. We also need to consider regulation. Now, the British Board of Film Classification has to regulate TV shows that are released on DVD and Blu-ray. And originally for streaming services, but they can't do that now, so they've given uh, Netflix permission to do it for them. But um, Life on Mars, as you can see, was certified as a 12 certificate because it contained moderate violence and sex references. Passed for DVD release and cut. The Bridge, also a 15, well, it's a 15 certificate, not a 12 certificate, a 15 uh, because strong violence, threat, sex, injury details, strong language and drug use. Um, again, passed uncut. Surprisingly difficult to get an 18 certificate nowadays. You've got to be pretty extreme to get an 18 nowadays. And that covers that. That's everything we need to know for that. Um, if I find any more information, I'll let you know. Um, if you've got any questions, you know where to find me. You can email me, ask me in class, whatever. I know that's a long video, but again, I want to do as much of this as I can while I've got a bad back in case I can't do it in class. So, talk to you next time.